Hello, everyone. Welcome to Examining Evolution. I'm so privileged to have Dr. Rob Stadler here with me today. He's the author of a few books. One of them is called The Scientific Approach to Evolution, and one of them is The Stairway to Life and Origin of Life Reality Check. These are both books I love, and he co-authored this with um, Dr. Change Laura Tan, who has a PhD in biochemistry from the University of Pennsylvania and is um, or was the professor of biological scientists, uh, sciences at the University of Missouri. Now, Dr. Stadler has a PhD in medical engineering from the Harvard MIT Division of Health Sciences, and he has a great interest in uh, this topic. Dr. Stadler, can you tell us what got you started in looking at the origin of life? Yeah. Hi, Rebecca. Thanks for having me on today. Mm -hmm. um, what got me interested in this topic is just in, in reading through the literature and reading through the scientific literature on this topic, I was amazed to find so many uh, titles of manuscripts, abstracts, um, claims, concluding sentences that to me were discordant with the data that's actually in the manuscript and what they actually found. And then when that becomes caught up in the popular media, it gets amplified and the media portrays it as everything is solved. You can just wash your hands clean of all these challenges that we've basically already created life in the lab through natural processes. That's, that's what's kind of portrayed in the media. And I see so many people misled by this and swept up by it. And, and, and so that kind of led me to want to write, help write this book on the topic to kind of, kind of inject some reality into that. Okay, great. Well, and I'm so glad you did. And I, it, this book was really helpful to me and I know it's been helpful to a lot of people, but there's also been some criticism. And recently I had Dessel Drace on the channel and he's very knowledgeable about the topic of origin of life. And he's read a lot of the recent research and presented a lot of the papers and, and the research from the papers regarding uh, this topic. And we kind of went through some of the steps in your book. So in The Stairway to Life, for those who haven't read it, uh, Dr. Stadler and uh, Dr. Um, Laura Tan, Change Laura Tan, they present the difficulties, like the different levels of difficulties of achieving life. And it's, they present it in kind of a stair step form, like, okay, it would be difficult to get, you know, it, or very implausible to get this to happen. But even if we did get that to happen, we'd still have to have this to happen. And Drace kind of went through some of those steps and gave explanations for those. And Dr. Stadler has seen that and desired to come on here and kind of make a response to Drace's comments. Yeah, indeed. It, it was like a two hour and 15 minute video. And that was about uh, two weeks ago. And so getting through that, that two hours and 15 minutes and digging up all of the manuscripts that he mentioned here and there has been has been has taken a lot of work, a lot of effort. So um, I'm looking forward to to responding to that tonight. I just wanted to start off by saying uh, that that Dessel has clearly worked very hard, and he's performed extensive literature searches. He collected. He's. I thought I heard 21 pages of notes that he had compiled uh, and made an impressive presentation. And I, I appreciate his focus on digging into the evidence and the persistence he has. And he also kind of presented with um, kind of a winsome attitude. There was no, no personal attacks, which I really do appreciate. I like to see that. And it's kind of hard to find that in these days. Um, so like I mentioned, it took me a couple of weeks to dig through all of this. Um, and I'll start off by saying that um, he is right that the, the Stairway to Life, our book, it certainly didn't review every one of those manuscripts. I don't know if any book can can possibly contain reviews of all the scientific manuscripts out there because there's just so many. And a book like that would be very tedious and nobody would want to read that thing because it would just be too much of a burden. Um, but um, in particular, the book didn't dive too deeply into the topic of alkaline hydrothermal vents. 
which is his focus and his passion. In our book, we relied heavily on um, Nick Lane's book, The Vital Question. So Nick Lane is a researcher from London who <clears throat> is very passionate about alkaline hydrothermal vent theory as well. And so we kind of uh, focused on that as giving us insight to that theory, the hydrothermal vent theory, and, and focused on that. Um, so clearly there are a number of advocates of hydrothermal vent theory, just like Drace and Nick Lane, others like that. Uh, but a good proponent of a theory must not only be open to criticism from others, but also to think critically on their own as they're studying it, reading about it, whatever it is, to think beyond the words in the manuscript, think beyond the words and the numbers to, you know, maybe what are the challenges here and what what's missing? And a lot of people are easily tripped up by the strong assumptions that are made in these scientific manuscripts, the assumptions maybe not highlighted, maybe even buried somewhere in there, and some of the titles that are provocative and sound very convincing. And then, of course, by the media who tends to amplify this stuff. So th this is a very common phenomenon. Um, and Drace's presentation was very biased in favor of alkaline vents, frankly. And it was to the point where the succession of many bold claims that he made began to strain imagination in, in my view. So, well, Dr. Stadler, for those who are not really familiar with like the status of the origin of life research, like, can you just take, you know, two minutes to tell people like separate fact from fiction on origin of life? Because somebody just recently told me like, oh, we've created life in the lab. So and and they pulled up a news article that said yeah. that. And when I looked at it, it wasn't quite what it presented. But there's a lot of like um, misunderstanding about where we're actually at. So can you just explain to people where are we actually at with origin of life? Well, um, I'm very concerned. And that's what caused me to write this book at all the conclusions, like you just mentioned, that so many people are completely misled by this, thinking that life has been made in the lab. A paper just came out yesterday or today about how there's a Japanese group that said they have made a self-replicating ribosome. And, you know, I kind of sigh every time I see that stuff, because then when you actually get the paper and read it, you find out they borrowed all these components from existing life. And they showed that this happens outside of life in a Petri dish, but only when you put all the components of life into the Petri dish. And so the term self-replicating is very poorly defined. I, I think it needs to be redefined. It's not self-replicating. It's replicating with a whole lot of help from life. And one way to refer to that, I think, is cheating. <laughs> That's the strong way to say it. It's actually cheating by taking life in order to suggest that life could have started on its own. Mm. I. I think I think going through this data here will help to answer your more general question of okay. where we are in mm -hmm. in getting toward life. But the the really short answer is um, we haven't gotten very far. I mean, Miller and Ure produced back in 1962. They produced very simple building blocks like individual amino acids, and I don't think a whole lot more has been accomplished since then. And I'm sure that's an inflammatory statement. So maybe I should get into the data to, to speak to that. Okay, great. So um, starting off, um, Dessel made the claim that these alkaline hydrothermal vents with all their special conditions basically provide all of the building blocks needed for life. And when I say building blocks, we're talking about amino acids, and nucleotides and lipids, carbohydrates. And uh, just to pull a quote out from your conversation with him, at 41 minutes, 21 seconds into the video, he said, what's been shown experimentally so far? You get pretty much everything that you need already in terms of being experimentally shown. There's a little bit to do with nucleotide formation that I'm a bit unhappy with because I wanted to see them in higher yields. And then at 56 minutes, 40 seconds, he says, 
even though they have synthesized canonical nucleotides, like gone all the way there, like step by step by step, going all the way up to canonical nucleotides, that particular paper showed they only gave us 8% yield. And that particular paper he's talking to is uh, Kim and Kim, a, pre a prebiotic synthesis of canonical pyrimidine and purine ribonucleotides from Astrobiology 2019. So when you actually pull up that paper and you read it, and you know the first three words in that title are a prebiotic synthesis of, and that sounds pretty impressive. And this is the kind of thing that bugs me and misleads people. So when you actually read the paper, what you find out is they prepared solutions and they heated them up until the solution became completely dry, absolutely dehydrated dry, and then kept it there at 100 to 125 degrees C for between three and 96 hours. So we're talking dry. And so to think that that relates in any way to an alkaline hydrothermal vent condition uh, kind of puzzles me. How do you get absolute dryness for three to 96 hours? Um, and in the discussion, they clearly say that again, it had to be dry and it, it kind of represents what they thought was a volcano, volcanic activity. Um, so, so then Drace talks about getting 8% yield of ribonucleotides, which are the building blocks for RNA. Um, and that's pretty close. The paper actually said they get a 7% yield of cytosine, which is one of the ribonucleotides. But then you look at uracil and guanine, and they actually got less than 1% yield. So you could say I'm nitpicking there. Okay. Well, it turns out that guanine is not actually soluble in water. So when you read the details in the paper, guanine, that one ribonucleotide, they had to dissolve that one in ammonia, not in water, because it wouldn't dissolve in water. So they dissolve it in ammonia, and then they heat it up and, and boil off all the liquid, make it super dry, keep it that way for three to 96 hours. And then they end up with less than 1% of the ribonucleotide they wanted. So again, these are small details, but when you add them up and you keep adding up the assumptions and the little details, you end up in the, in the end with a false conclusion. Your summary statement ends up being very misleading. So, um, but was it a building up of the things, because I'm not, I'm not sure what they started with. Did they? That's a, that's a great question, and I did not mm -hmm. pay you to ask that question, but that's the perfect, <laughs> that's the perfect question, right? Because they claim in the title it's a prebiotic synthesis, mm -hmm. uh, but where did where did they get that? Okay, so in the paper you read, what they started with is what's called ribose one two cyclic phosphate. And where did they get that? Did they get that by going into a hydrothermal vent and pulling out this stuff, right? That's what I would think. Well, no, they got it from a place called Toronto Research Chemicals through the internet, right? And, and I don't think hydrothermal vents had the internet or a place called Toronto Research Chemicals. But um, the discussion in that paper claims that these materials can be obtained under prebiotic conditions. But then it also admits that selective prebiotic synthesis is a quote, the selective prebiotic synthesis of ribose with high yield has not been reported. So they're basically saying you could make ribose, it has been shown, but it's very low yield. Now that ribose then would have to be modified to get to one ribose one, two cyclic phosphate. That's a different process that also has a reduced yield. And then you take that moving on to try to make this guanine through this whole process with ammonia, which gives you less than 1% yield. So we're talking about what, what is a serious problem in this field, and that's called relay synthesis. Relay synthesis. I do an experiment. I find the one little thing I wanted to find. I claim success and move on. And then the next study goes to the lab shop and buys 100% pure that product and starts up with that. And they 
take the next step, make something. Oh, I found exactly what I wanted. They claim success and they're done. Now what you're talking about here is like the third or fourth step in that relay synthesis. And they're trying to make guanine go through all this trouble and they get less than 1% of it, but they got it. Success, right? And so again, you have to add up this succession of approximations and, and you know, not so good um, yields and you end up with a serious mass transfer problem that is actually hopeless in an actual laboratory. Now, yeah, Drace, when it, mm -hmm. sorry, Drace then tries to kind of recover from that, I think, by citing a paper by Akamura, 2019, a one pot water compatible synthesis of pyrimidine nucleobases under plausible prebiotic conditions. And he says it's one pot. So they did all this in one pot. So it's not a relay synthesis. So they say, but it turns out this is just nucleobases. Nucleobases are not nucleotides. They're much more simple. And that's a long way from a nucleotide. So it's kind of like bait and switch there. Mm, okay. Well, when Drace was talking about this, it, it, it kind of made it seem like the getting these chemicals in the hydrothermal vents is easy, right? right. Um, but now you're describing one step and you said there's like, by that step, they had already done three different other steps. In different but, laboratories. So what what do you think would be the starting conditions and then like how hard is it really to get to this step of chemical well i don't think you're going to make um ribonucleotides in this kind of scenario maybe someday someone will dig through an alkaline hydrothermal vent and find one um, but that's actually not even that may be a nice success, but it's not all that useful because what other stuff is in there that gets in the way? And that's kind of the next topic I wanted to get to is um, Dessel kind of presented like these vents produce, they don't only produce the stuff that life wants, that life would need, but only that stuff, right? And we all know that in chemistry, if you mix a bunch of reagents, or even a small number of reagents, the reactions that happen are going to end up filling a lot of chemodiversity. It's going to end up filling a space. You could call it a chemical space of all the possible uh, molecules that could come out of that those reactants. It's the full extent of all possible molecular products. And that number is going to end up being astronomically large um, compared to the stuff you're interested in. So let me give you a real practical example. Um, you'll hear a lot about the Murchison meteorite. And the Murchison meteorite, you know, came up from outer space and they picked it up and looked inside of it. And they actually found some amino acids. According to David Deemer, 2019, his book, Assembling Life, uh, they actually found 10 of the 20 amino acids that are required for life. They found them in this meteorite. And that's what you tend to hear about in, in the media and so forth, is you'll hear this positive story of what was actually found in the meteorite that relates to life. And that's it's not that surprising because Miller Ure, uh, in their experiment in the 60s, just had some simple gas and water and stuff and ended up making amino acids. So it's not really earth shattering. It's not a big deal. And so the, um, the media picks up on this and they focus on finding those molecules of life in a meteorite, which is big news, right? That's what they focus on. And they don't tend to focus on what else do you find in that meteorite? And so what else you find is this chemodiversity. You get all this stuff, all this junk that you could even call asphalt. But here's a direct quote about the Murchison meteorite. It, it contained, quote, tens of thousands of different molecular compositions and likely millions of diverse structures, which suggests that the extraterrestrial chemodiversity is high compared to terrestrial relevant biological and biochemical driven space. Okay, meaning if you're out there in space and whatever's happening to this meteorite, it's creating all kinds of variety of uh, hodgepodge of a bunch of junk 
And yes, inside there, you might find some amino acids. It's so complex that you actually can't really analyze it all and, and try to find each of the million components because that's very expensive, time consuming and nearly impossible. But they're in there. And that quote I, I just made was from uh, Schmidt Copland uh, from Proceedings in National Academy of Science in two, 2010. I can also give you um, simulation that's very similar to this. There's a simulation program called Alchemy, and that's by Wiltos et al. It's a Polish group. Their paper, Synthetic Connectivity, Emergence, and Self-Regeneration in the Network of Prebiotic Chemistry from Science 2020. And they started with simply, you know, water, nitrogen, hydrogen cyanide, ammonia, methane, and hydrogen sulfide. So six very simple molecules, six of them. And they put this in their computer simulation and had them react. Okay. And they do this in rounds. So round one reaction is the first thing that came out. Round two, round three. Okay. After seven rounds of this synthesis through computer simulation, and they use computer simulation because it's so complex. Uh, but after seven rounds, they came up with 36,685 different molecule types. Very large diversity of different molecules, 36,000. Of the 36,000, only 82 of the types of molecules had anything to do with life. So we're talking about one molecule related to life versus 500 that are not related to life. Now those 500 are going to get in the way. They're going to get in the way of the molecules you want to interact. They're bumping into all the wrong stuff and causing reactions that you don't want and maybe even toxic things happening. And they actually stopped their simulation after just seven rounds because it got so complicated. But if you went 10, 12, 15, 30, 100 rounds of this simulation, what do you end up with? You end up with millions of molecules of junk, kind of like in Murchison Meteorite, versus just a few that you're actually interested in. And this is what's going to happen in the alkaline uh, hydrothermal vents. Now, Dessel in his presentation made it seem kind of the opposite. At 45 minutes into his presentation, he said, quote, the gradients that exist in there in the hydrothermal vents drive product selectivity. Now, I don't doubt that there's a little bit of filtering going on through the thermophoresis process. But to take, you know, 500 molecules you don't want and leave just the one that you do want, the one out of 500, again, this kind of strains your imagination. At one hour and 25 minutes, 20 seconds into your talk with Dessel, he said, quote, the waste is naturally filtered out. It flows through that alkaline fluid and percolates out into the ocean where these heavier organics are trapped inside the vents in the colder, more stabilized regions. So again, I'm sure there's some filtering of some sort going on there, but it's not gonna get rid of molecules that weigh about the same amount, about the same size, but you don't want these ones and you do want this one over here. That kind of filtering is extremely precise and it's not gonna happen in the vent. So- yeah, um, and it life, don't we have like specialized um, mechanisms that allow for certain things to go out and don't let the, you know, other stuff go out? Like this is yeah. one of the things that you mentioned in your book. So what's the difference between what Drace is describing and what is actually present in life? What's actually present in life are highly complicated enzymes, which are extremely selective about what they pick and choose, right? almost like a human that could pick a good cherry out of a whole box of bad cherries, <laughs> right? That's what life can do. But a uh, hydrothermal vent, although it may have some filtering capability, it's not going to be able to keep only the stuff you want and not what you don't want. At, at two hours and 12 minutes into the your talk with Drace, which is a long time, uh, he basically said that the asphalt paradox does not apply in an aqueous environment. If you think of this in the most general term, the asphalt paradox being a whole bunch of stuff you don't want that gets in the way, uh, I certainly disagree with that. I think you're going to end up with just piles and piles of stuff that either gets in the way or is actually toxic towards life. 
and it's going to be there along with the stuff you want. Another example of that is when Drace talks about minerals and metals that are present in the vent, which of course there are minerals and metals present in the vent, and they are able to do catalytic type reactions. But, you know, again, here we are reading about how we praise the reactions that we do want happening toward life and brushing aside or ignoring the reactions that are encouraged by these same catalysts that you don't want. Catalysts like that, they're going to reduce any kind of kinetic inhibitions, right? They're not going to change the thermodynamics, but they change the kinetics. And they can do that by reducing the kinetics, they make it possible for reaction to go forward, but they make it equally possible for the reaction to go backward. Uh, and that's the problem with these very simple kind of catalysts. But we also know very well that um, divalent cations like calcium, iron two, magnesium, they tend to keep membranes from forming. They get in the way, they'll, they'll make it so you can't have a membrane. They will also help to make RNA fall apart. They'll make the RNA kind of attack itself, cleave itself, and break itself up into pieces. That's especially true of these um, certain kind of metals. And it's mentioned in a paper by Martha Fedor, 2002, the role of metal ions in RNA catalysis. It's also well known by Jack Shostak, who mentions this quite a bit, uh, the high concentrations of divalent cations required for RNA template copying, which is what he focused on, they also catalyze RNA degradation. And they're incompatible with known vesicle replication systems. In other words, they destroy the cell membrane. Um, and we also know that magnesium 2 plus, very common in this situation, it also makes RNA duplexes, um, two complementary RNAs that stick together, it makes them stick together even more. So they're harder to separate with heat. Uh, and, and you can't replicate RNA when it's stuck together like that. So just keeping an open mind there, you can't think of these metal, cat these metal uh, catalysts and uh, minerals as only doing what you want to get to life because they're gonna do, it cuts both ways. That's the problem. And next we can go on to homochirality which be another requirement to get to life. And I do appreciate uh, Dessel's openness here somewhat when discussing homochirality. Uh, it's at one hour and six minutes, he said, I'm not sure whether or not I believe these abiotic processes led to a pure homochiral state, which is good that he said that. It's good that he's thinking in those terms, but he certainly doesn't hesitate to throw out a lot of optimism and, and kind of a, a smoke screen about that. He points out papers from this guy named Joseph Rebo, a paper from 2013 about spontaneous mirror symmetry breaking. And it turns out that paper is purely a numerical simulation. Uh, it's just a computer simulation where they're trying to see where this, you know, theory of spontaneous mirror break symmetry breaking could happen. And in that paper, they talk about reasonable chemical parameters suggesting an adequate scenario for spontaneous mirror symmetry breaking to happen in a hydrothermal vent. So it's all hypothetical and a, a computer simulation. And in another paper by that same author in 2017, which is called Spontaneous Mirror Symmetry Breaking and the Origin of Biological Homochirality, there they mention clearly that there's been very few examples experimentally that actually show this spontaneous mirror symmetry breaking, and they're really not well described. And yet they're building this whole hypothesis that somehow alkaline hydrothermal vents would do this for all of the molecules needed for life, you know, which is a whole lot of hope, uh, a whole lot of optimism and wishes, but there's really not a lot of actual data behind it. So we certainly don't have proof that that can happen. So that's another step in the requirement to get to life that is absent in our hydrothermal vent scenario. So we can't make ribonucleotides. Uh, we get a whole bunch of junk 
chemicals that we don't want and we can't make them homochiral. So that's, that's where we are so far. And the next step, this is like one hour, 14 seconds into the video. Uh, Dessel brings up his favorite, he called it his favorite abiogenesis paper by Mast et al. 2013. Escalation of polymerization in a thermal gradient. Uh, this paper talks about how the thermophoresis that's present in the vents really helps to encourage polymerization. And it brings up a, a somewhat <laughs> unimaginably large number of 10 to the 600 fold increased likelihood of RNA polymerization. And, um, and Dessel compares this to some numbers, some probabilities that were mentioned in the book, The Stairway to Life. But there's a bit of a conflating going on here because the, the numbers mentioned in The Stairway to Life are not speaking about the likelihood of making any polymer. They, in the book, the numbers are speaking about the likelihood of making a useful polymer. Not just any polymer, but one that actually is useful. And there's two big steps to that. The first step would take, it means making the molecules in a canonical form. In other words, the type of bonds and form that you have in life in RNA. So you need the nucleotides made just right. And you need to have them link up through three prime, five prime, prime phospho phosphodiester bonds. It has to be the right kind of backbone bond connecting them together. And that's extremely unlikely through pure probability. Even if you can get them to polymerize, you're gonna end up polymerizing random junk. Now, if you could get them to polymerize in the canonical form, you get the right kind of bonds, the right kind of backbone, then you have the problem faced of getting them to polymerize into a useful RNA, not junk. So. If you're able to, Rebecca, can you put up a picture that I sent of uh, the first one, that one there. So in this paper by Mast et al., they talk about how these alkaline hydrothermal vents could produce an RNA polymer with 200 ribonucleotides. You call it a 200 mer of RNA. And um, I'm betting that they're mentioning 200 and they talk about 200 needed to make something that's self-replicating. And I think that's because they're talking about this RNA right here in front of you, right? This is um, the Azoarchus ribozyme, and it comes from a living thing, right? This is taken out of bacteria. It's a pretty cool, uh, I said ribos, ribozyme, yes, I said ribozyme. It's a pretty cool piece of RNA because if you break this up into four pieces in a certain way, it will be able to reassemble itself. It can put those four pieces back together to get what you see here on the screen. And that's pretty cool. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, but that's from a living thing. So it's kind of cheating again to take something alive and use that as evidence that you could create life from natural processes. But anyway, you can look at this and you see you see the different letters, C, C, U, G, A, U, so forth. Yeah. You need to have that sequence. Each one of those is a ribonucleotide. And you need to have this particular sequence of 200 letters in the right order in order to have that function of, quote unquote, self-assembling itself. I would not call that self-replicating because you got to start with five, four chunks of it that are about 50 nucleotides already properly ordered, really hard to get that. And you have to get those four chunks made and together, and then it will assemble itself. So I don't call that self-replicating. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. That's not self-replicating. That's kind of like helping itself assemble. Yes, but not self-replicating. Anyway, my point here is, if you could get in a alkaline hydrothermal vents, you could get the ability to polymerize RNA, which as we've already gone through is a sequence of steps that haven't been shown yet. But if you could get it to polymerize and suddenly this alkaline hydrothermal vent starts cranking out 200 mers of RNA, right? Those are gonna have just random letters, 200 long, 
with a canonical form like this, but the, the wrong letters. It'll just spit them out with 200 letters. Oh, that's wrong. Spit out another one with 200 letters. No, nope, that's not it. 200 letters, spit it out. No, nope, that's not right. Um, the number of these that you'd have to crank out in order to find this one that you see on the screen with this code is um, the number would be 10 to the 192, I think is what I came up with. I lost my so point. is that a number that could be achieved in, say, a billion years? <laughs> no, I'm sorry. It's 10 to the 120th. So okay. the number 10 with 120 zeros after that mm -hmm. is how many of these you'd have to crank out. Now, if you imagine, if you could just imagine the entire universe, all the mass of the entire universe consisting of nothing but RNA with 200 MERS like this, in the entire universe, you would not be able to find one of these. That's how rare, how hard it would be to produce this particular useful RNA. So you'd end up with a huge, huge pile of garbage bigger than the universe in order to get one of these guys that you see on, in front of you. So in the alkaline hydrothermal vents, you have these little pores that are a few centimeters, a little pore, and that's where this um, polymerization is supposed to be taking place. And this paper by MAST tells us that polymerization should be pretty easy to happen in that vent. But if you're starting to crank out RNA, if you could do that, you're going to crank out piles and piles and piles of useless junk. And one molecule in an infinite amount will actually be useful. So how do you get rid of all that junk? Well, Drace, I guess, is saying that thermophoresis will somehow filter out the stuff you don't want and keep those few molecules that you might want. Meanwhile, you've filled the entire ocean with, with spaghetti, random spaghetti like this that has no purpose. So it is an impossible scenario to get, um, not only to get the RNA to form, but then to have it be useful. Quite a challenge. And it seems like Mast et al. and Drace are both very concerned just how do you get a polymer to form. And so my point here is, fine, you can get a polymer to form, but you need a polymer that's useful, not just any piece of spaghetti. That's the point. So then we can move on to one more topic, which is energy harnessing. Okay. Uh, we know that the alkaline hydrothermal vents through this pH gradient, they do have energy and the energy is there. It's there all the time and it's there for free. The problem is how do you actually use it in, in chemistry that leads toward life? Uh, there's a guy named Michael Marshall who wrote a book. It's a book called The Genesis Quest, came out in 2020. And here's a quote from him. He's actually very in favor of abiogenesis. So this is a quote from from the pro side, the, he says, quote, the biggest problem for the alkaline vent hypothesis is not is its most unique element, which at first sight seems the most convincing. The idea that a natural proton gradient could supply the energy to kickstart metabolism. This idea is a brilliant intuitive leap, but there is no experimental evidence. The problem is twofold. First, we do not know that there we do not know that there are sharp proton gradients within the vents like Lost City. Instead, the alkali may slowly blend into acid over the length of each chimney, in which case the proton gradient will be so gentle, it'll be too gentle to generate useful power. Second, Second part, this is the one I'm more interested in. Second, the enzymes that life uses, including the one that makes ATP, are big and complex. So far, nobody has found a simpler version that works and could possibly have formed. This absence is glaring, just as the lack of a self-replicating RNA has been a problem for the RNA world. So he's basically saying there is energy there but it's not energy that's useful toward life because you have to harness it, for example, by making ATP and putting ATP to work to build the molecules that you want and not, 
not just raw energy, which tends to destroy things. Um, cool. And I think you also mentioned uh, the difficulty of getting ATP synthase uh, or like, um, be in, so you've got kind of a chicken and egg thing going on with that too. Because you need ATP in order to make an ATP synthase. Uh, that's quite a problem. And I was amazed in Nick Lane's book, The Vital Question, that he just kind of wishes ATP into existence. You know, he just said, there it is. It's a product of natural selection. And it just sort of shows up in his models. Uh, it's an exceptionally, exceptionally complex nano machine um, that, you know, there's, there's a lot of a lot of hoping and magic and stuff that he would need in order to produce his ATP through natural processes. It makes no sense. Now, um, Dessel and I had a little bit of a discussion through, um, I think it was through Facebook or something about this, where um, I had mentioned uh, some work by Brian Miller that showed that, yes, the alkaline hydrothermal vents have some free energy, but the amount of energy that's available to build up molecules is very small. And Brian Miller showed compared to any kind of living cell today, the vents produce about 100 million times less energy density than are needed to keep the simplest of cells alive. And Dessel responded to that with a paper by Yamamoto, 2013, called Generation of Electricity and Illumination by an Environmental Fuel Cell in a Deep Sea Hydrothermal Vents. So in that paper, it's kind of cool. They were, they were able to show that you could light up LEDs through the kind of um, proton gradients, you know, the, the pH gradient that you find in these alka alkaline hydrothermal vents. So there is voltage there. We know that there's raw energy there, but there's quite a difference between raw energy, like a lightning bolt or a volcano or an earthquake or a hydrothermal vent and the kind of chemical free energy that you need in order to get metabolism going. You have to capture, you have to harness that energy and put it to use in a productive way, not just voltage that you can light up an LED with. It's, it's an entirely different process. And that's, the subject of the, the latest um, long story short animated video that, that we put out that's worth looking at. I'm, I'm getting close to done. I know it's it's been, <laughs> there's a lot here. Oh, it's great. I'm so happy to have you on. This is wonderful. So don't don't feel pressured to, to you know, cut it short. Just yeah, yeah. say well, everything you want to say. You know, the so we've gone through a lot of things that are basically showstoppers for this scenario. You can't make nucleotides. You can't get them filtered out from all the junk other molecules that are around. You can't get homochirality. If you start to make polymers, you're going to end up with spaghetti of all kinds of junk, with piles and piles of useless polymers, and you can't filter them out to get to the polymer that you do want, the RNA that you do want. Um, you can't harness energy in a way that you'd like to build up life. Now, the big, big, big showstopper is self-replication. You're going to need to get to a point where the molecules replicate themselves. And that has never been demonstrated. True self-replication has never been seen. And that example you put on the screen of the Azoarchus ribozyme is a touch in that direction. It's you know a little bit of a step in that direction. And you can see how an exceedingly complex RNA that that was. So no self-replication, no life, no chance, and a conversation kind of end there. But we go on. Um, after you even after you get self-replication, if that were to happen, the next big challenge is information management. And I really like uh, Paul Davies in this topic. And he wrote a book called The Demon in the Machine from 2019. And here's a quote from that book. He said, quote, there is a more fundamental reason why efforts to cook up life in the lab are unlikely to solve the mystery of life's origin. As I have stressed in this book, the distinctive character of life is the ability to store 
and process information in an organized manner. Of course, life also requires complex chemistry, organic molecules from the substrate in what form the substrate in which life performs its software feats. But that's only half the story. That's the hardware half. And Paul Davies here is talking about the software half, the information storage and, and, and management. And the quote goes on, uh, the actual chemical steps may not have been as important as the really critical transition, the one from inchoate molecular mayhem to organized information management. How did that happen? Unquote. So that's kind of beyond everything we've talked about is even how do you manage information like all of life does? Well, how do you get the information in the first place? <laughs> well, the hypothesis would be that your molecules who self-replicate um, occasionally self-replicate with mistakes. And those mistakes occasionally are beneficial that make, you know, it's natural selection making the molecule better and better over time. Um, that's, that's supposedly where you build up information, but we're a long way from getting to that in a prebiotic kind of scenario. So I do have one more point to make, and, and that'll cause um, the people on, on, that watch this that are opposed to everything here, it'll make them cringe because you can't help but look at real life, existing life, and see the examples there. Now, how foolish of me to, to consider real life, actual examples from real life, to think of that as a goal that we're trying to get to here, but that's what we're gonna do. So if in a hydrothermal vent, you're able to have this incubation going on and slowly over time and all this, you build up to where you have something that has a metabolism and, and it's kind of alive, then it needs to be birthed. It needs to come out of the vent and live on its own somehow, right? It's now trying to stay alive on its own. That would be the first living thing in a world with no life, right? And what would that thing look like? And we have some things in real life that might be close to that. There is a bacteria that was formed that was found, sorry, it was found in a deep gold mine in South Africa. This particular bacteria lives like a kilometer or more underground and it lives without any other kind of life, right? So it's, it, it's called a prototroph or an autotroph. It's able to live by itself with no help from anybody, nothing else around, and it lives completely without oxygen. In fact, oxygen will kill it. Uh, so it's a bit hard to cultivate it, um, but, um, that's similar, I suppose, to what would be coming out of this hydrothermal vent. It doesn't have oxygen, doesn't want oxygen, uh, but able to keep itself alive without any help. And that bacteria we're talking about, you can look it up. It's called D. sulfurutis auto, autox viator. Autox viator. So um, if you could put up the slide, Rebecca, there was the other slide I sent you. And this is basically an article about that particular bacteria. And it's this author's hypothesis that this thing is showing us how life started, you know, deep below the earth's surface. Because it's pretty amazing that it can take, uh, it can take care of itself and, and, and find food and energy out of very, very simple things. But what they don't mention in this paper, which is so critical, is we're not talking here about life that's able to be super simple because this life form has to have all the tools to do everything to make it on its own. This thing is kind of like a Swiss army knife, right? It's got just tools everywhere to be able to do all this complicated stuff and make it on its own. It's a big boy, you know, it can handle anything coming at it. So this, this particular bacteria has over 2,100 genes in its DNA because it has to. Now you might be able to, you know, trim a little bit of fat off of that, you know, take it down to 2000 genes and maybe it could still live, limp along a little bit. But the point is it's a, it's, it's a relatively complex bacteria and it has to be in order to survive in those situations. 
we can contrast that with a much simpler form of life like uh, Craig Venter, who actually made this JVCI SYN 3A, a very simple single cell organism that only has 493 genes, right? So it only has a quarter of the DNA that this deep underground um, desulfuritis has. Now, that thing with only 493 genes needs to live a coddled existence. It needs to have everything provided for it just as it needs it. It only can use glucose as its only energy source, right? So you have to feed this thing glucose and you have to feed it everything it needs and take away its waste. You have to clean up its waste or else the waste eventually will inhibit its growth and kill it. So that's a very coddled and dependent kind of life form when you get down to 493 genes. If you want something that's robust and can live on its own, you're going to need more than 2,000 genes. And this is what all that we know about life tells us very clearly. And so how are you going to get that from a hydrothermal vent situation? That's quite a challenge. And just to clarify, you know, what you said about Dr. Ventner, you said he made this cell, but what you mean he took stuff that he already, he took a cell and basically messed with it, right? Yeah. I mean, he didn't yeah. make everything from scratch. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that. Mm -hmm. So he took he took a an existing mycoplasma, which is a simple kind of bacteria, and just started stripping stuff out, kind of like throwing stuff on a boat and throwing it overboard, right? And, and stripping it out to try to see how simple can we make this already living thing and have it still survive. Exactly. So mm -hmm. to to wrap this up, thanks for your patience and, mm -hmm. and going through all this. There, there is a lot of literature out there on abiogenesis and the titles on their own can be quite misleading. Even the abstracts can be misleading and the conclusions they come to. You have to dig deep and you have to appreciate the assumptions they've made and the limitations and what they're doing. And also to appreciate the difference between conjecture and simulation and then actual experiment. And then, you know, it was very wise of you when we talked about the experiment to say, what do they start with? What are the starting materials? And where do you get those starting materials? You got to question everything. Um, but, you know, when you look at an alkaline hydrothermal vent, just to summarize here, you got no nucleotides, you have no homochirality, which is essential for life. There's no way to do canonical linkage of the polymers exactly like they are in RNA. Once you start polymerizing, you have no control over it. There's no way to stop it. There's no way to get rid of the useless junk that you produce, mountains and mountains of useless junk. There's no way to repair the good polymers. Um, there's no way to sort out only the good polymers that you want. There's no way to do self-replication. Uh, energy harnessing is far from easy to accomplish. I don't have any good data there. And then information storage and processing and then transitioning to life on its own outside the vents. Also very big challenge there. And none of this was addressed in Dessel's uh, talk in my mind. So this, all of this together kind of reminds me of a paper uh, by a guy named Harold Bernhardt in 2012. And the title of this paper will catch your eye. It's called The RNA World Hypothesis, The Worst Theory of the Evolution of Early Evolution of Life except for all the others. And in this situation, what we nice. have, in this situation, what you might have is a paper called the alkaline hydrothermal vent hypothesis, which is the worst theory of the early evolution of life, except for all the others. So in other words, if you got to pick your favorite theory of how life started through purely natural processes, alkaline hydrothermal vents may be the best option that's out there, but it certainly is not even close to explaining how naturalistic processes could get us to life. So it's 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 the worst theory we have except for all the others. Wow, thank you so much, Dr. Stadler. This has been great. And guys, you can get Dr. Stadler's 
book, uh, The Stairway to Life, An Origin of Life Reality Check on Amazon at the link that I posted below. And he also has a book called this, A Scientific Approach to Evolution, which I highly recommend. It's a really good book and it really kind of shows you the difference between high confidence science and low confidence science and just um, kind of measures the claims of the theory of evolution and the evidence that's presented for that uh, against the ways that we test um, to see whether something is good science. So and I, please check that out. Mm -hmm. And I can say, I, you know, I welcome comments here on the, the YouTube page. Um, I'm not going to be able to answer all of them, but you know, those that are genuine comments and inquisitive, whatever, I'm, I'm, I'll try to keep monitoring for those. Um, but maybe that's one way to carry on the conversation. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Stadler. I appreciate you responding to Drace, and I'm sure that he'll appreciate your response as well. I know he's done a lot of work on this, and he did a lot of work to present, and so I'm sure that he will be grateful that you took the time to to respond to what he, he presented. So thank you. Yeah, and again, I appreciate all the work he put into it and his openness to... to uh to have criticism or to talk through things and uh, let's keep it that way. Okay, great. Thanks everyone. Yep. Thank you.